intersections in polar. So the intersections in polar are going to be a little bit different than they are in Cartesian. Um, and this is basically just due to the fact that polar points are not unique, right? So in Cartesian, there's only one way to designate any given point in space, right? Ordered pair x, y. Um, in polar, that is not true. And so what that means is in Cartesian, you just say, okay, let's like set the two equations equal, solve for the x where they intersect, and then we get the y value, and that point will be shared by both of them. Whereas in polar, uh, there could be points where one function, you know, maybe has um, contains the point two comma ninety, right? And the other function contains the point uh, negative two comma two seventy, right? And so those two points have different values, but are the same point in space. And because of that, um, you have to you have to tackle intersections in polar a little bit more carefully than you do in um, Cartesian. So first thing you always want to do is graph the functions because graphing the functions will let you know first, you know, are there intersections at all? Uh, it'll help you to estimate kind of how many intersections there are. And it's just good to have a picture in your head as you go through and think about these. Um, once you've graphed it, you always first want to see, uh, do they intersect at the pole? Um, this is usually really, really easy to see just by looking at the graph. But uh, if you don't want to, you can also think about it. And, and, and the way you can say uh, whether they intersect at the pole is by thinking, is there any value of theta for which one of the functions is equal to zero? And is there any other value of theta for which the other function is equal to zero? And if they're, if both the answer to both those questions is yes, then they will intersect at the pole. Remember, those values of theta don't have to be the same because if r is equal to zero anywhere, it's going to touch that pole, right? Second thing, um, here you're looking for intersections where r, the first function of theta plus 2 pi n, is equal to the second function. Um, so these uh, two, this is where, you, this is like the more traditional, let's just set them equal and solve because theta plus 2 pi n is typically equal to theta. And for our purposes, we're interested in um, uh, between 0 and 2 pi typically. So so usually this just turns into r1 of theta equals r2 of theta. So this is where you set equal, you solve, you find your intersections. The third one is the tricky one. Um, this one doesn't come up that that often, but it does uh, come up sometimes and you need to know how to handle it when it does. Um, this happens when if you go through and do the first two and say, I don't know, you find three intersections and you look at your graph and you say, oh no, there's supposed to be five intersections. Um, then the way you find the remaining intersections is by using the other possible set of points that could overlap, right? So one set of points is this idea that, okay, if I have r comma theta and I add 2 pi into it, it's just the same point again. This second, uh, or I guess third idea of intersections here, this is saying if I have some r theta, right, like this, then what I can do is say, okay, well, if I take this point r theta, and I add, let's say n is equal to zero just for, for ease of kind of thinking about it. If I add pi to it, right, I end up over here. So this is theta plus pi. And this is the same, right, as saying if I go negative r comma theta, right? So this point can be indicated either as r comma theta plus pi and as negative r comma theta. Right. This is the kind of the other ways, uh, the other way that you can have non-unique points in polar. Right. Is by flipping the sign of r and um, adjusting accordingly. So this is essentially what we're doing. So we're saying, okay, let's find all points for which like one of the functions is doing this, but the other function is doing this. And if that's the case, our first definition here that we use is going to miss these intersections. And our second way of finding intersections will find these ones. Right. But this will also miss these intersections, right? Because these are two different like classes of intersections that occur here. Um, and so both of them are only gonna give the intersections that satisfy exactly those requirements. Um, so most intersections are just the first, uh, are, are number two, um, but once in a while they'll go to three. So we're gonna go through, we're gonna do a bunch of problems here. We're gonna do five. Um, the last one will involve this third type of intersection, which is the, the most interesting type. Um, the others will leverage the graph and we'll kind of look at it and we'll use just trigonometry to, to get to the answer. So let's start with uh, this, r equals one and r equals two cosine theta. So these two um, graphs both graph circles, right? I can, I can sketch this. 
r equals one is a circle of radius one. Maybe I can, yeah, we'll just draw it. All right, draw a circle. And two cosine theta is gonna be a circle with a diameter of two, so it also has a radius of one. So it should look like it's about the same size here. Um, I tried this, you know, goes up a little higher. Let's let's try one more time. All right, whatever. So I know this point, right? This point is one comma zero, uh, and there are two intersections. Okay, they do not intersect to the pole. So first, I graphed. Ooh, that's good. Uh, R equals zero. No, there's no intersection at zero. I am looking for these two intersections. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, let's set uh, two cosine of theta plus two pi n equal to one. Okay. I'm always going to kind of do this to, to show you that this idea works, but for our purposes, like it's fine if you go straight to just setting them equal, um, because since we're only looking for solutions between zero and, and two pi, uh, the, the plus two pi n doesn't do a whole lot here. So um, I'll show you how you can get to the original thing from this. So that's going to be two um, and we use the sum of cosine or the sum of the arguments inside the cosine trig identity, right? Um, so again, not super useful to memorize trig identities, but you do want to recognize like, oh, I think this is a trig identity I want to use. Let me go look it up. So this is cosine theta, cosine two pi n minus sine theta, sine two pi n. And that's equal to one. And once you have this, right, sine of two pi n is always equal to zero. I, I should specify, you know, n is an integer, right? We want to make that clear. This is true for here too, for both of these. n is an integer. Um, and so this term is going to be equal to zero, right? Cosine of two pi n is equal to one. So then we just get two cosine theta is equal to one, which is, you know, the same thing we get if we just set it equal, right? So um, yeah, gives us what we expect. Then we solve this. So cosine theta equals one half. Then theta is going to be the arc cosine of one half. So that means that theta is going to be equal to positive or negative pi over three. And, you know, when we typically solve for trig function stuff, right, if you're just solving a general trig equation, you typically put this plus two pi n here. For our purposes, we're just doing like, you know, we want our, our angle to be between zero and two pi. So kind of unnecessary, right? Well, I'll add it in for completeness, but we can immediately go to our next step and say, okay, this gives us two angles, right? This gives us pi over three and negative pi over three and negative pi over three is just the same thing as five pi over three, right? So these are our two intersections, our two um, angles that uh, will have intersections. And if I want to, I need to figure out where the R value is, right? So I know, okay, this angle is going to be pi over three. This angle is going to be equal to five pi over three, but what's the R value? And what you can do is you can take these, right? And you can just plug them back into your original equations here. Uh, and, you know, if one of them looks easier to plug in, I, I'd use that one. So r equals one looks pretty easy to plug in, right? Both these points fall on the circle of radius one. So that means that my solution set is gonna be equal to one pi over three and one five pi over three. It's also a good way to check your work. Um, if you get to the end and you get two thetas and you plug them into both of your original equations and you get different things, uh, that's a problem. As long as you're, we're, we're talking about specifically like two. It's a problem for two. For three, you expect to get different things, which we'll talk about more in a little bit. But uh, yeah, for this one, if you're just setting them equal and solving and you back substitute in, you should always get the same R value for both equations. Okay, so that's the first one there, right? Um, we didn't miss any intersections, so that means we can stop. I don't need to go and try step three because this covered all the intersections that occur. Okay. So let's look at another one here. We have R equals cosine theta and R equals one minus cosine theta. Um, so these, right, this is going to be a circle again, and one minus cosine theta, this is a limason. Uh, and, uh, because the absolute value of a over B is equal to one, this is going to be a cardioid, but maybe you forgot that, right? Maybe you're just like, oh, I have these two trig functions. How do I find their intersections? How do I even graph these? Right? So remember, you can always just make a table and look for intercepts and kind of graph stuff that way. As long as you know what class of polar graph this is, right? I know this is supposed to be a circle. So if I make a table here, right, maybe I forget which way the circle faces. Um, make a little table, I do zero, pi over two, pi, 
3 pi over 2 and 2 pi. And I do the same thing over here. Theta r 0 pi over 2 pi 3 pi over 2 2 pi. And then um, I plug it in. So cosine of 0 is 1. Cosine of pi over 2 is 0. Cosine of pi is negative 1. Uh, cosine of, oh, I don't need 2 pi. I'm just going back around. Oops. Uh, cosine of 3 pi over 2 is 0 again. And over here, cosine of 0 is 1, so 1 minus 1 is 0. Cosine of pi over 2 uh, is 0, so that's going to give me 1. Cosine of pi is negative 1, so that's going to give me 2. And then cosine of 3 pi over 2 is 0 again. So then I can plot these. Okay, so I'll do that down here. So my circle, right, I have the point 1, comma 0. So let's put that here. And then I have 0 pi over 2, so that's going to be here. And then negative one pi. Be careful. And I know, like, if you're doing this, you you know how to graph polar points. But a lot of people mess up graphing negative one pi. A lot of people say, oh, negative one pi, that is over here. It's not right. It's not on the left because you start, you go negative one to the left, and you then rotate by pi. Okay, which brings us back to this same first point. Um, when people look at this, they see negative one pi, and they're like, oh, negative one is over here. And also, this is pi. So therefore, my point is negative 1 pi. They don't really think it through. They just kind of operate on, on gut like that because graphing polar is a little bit weird. So just be careful and, and you know, be, take your time when you're graphing polar points. So then um, the last one, 0, is just this point again. I knew this was supposed to be a circle. So that tells me I'm going to get something like this. I made my circle a little bit elliptical for some reason. Now it's elliptical the other way. Circles are hard. I don't know uh, what the trick is. OK. And then over here, I want to graph these points, right? So 0, 0 puts me here. Uh, 1 pi over 2 is going to put me up here, right around. Uh, 2 comma pi is going to put me way over here. And then 0, 3 pi over 2. Hmm. Uh, oh, that's, hmm. this should be. Uh, yeah, that's why I did this wrong. Sorry, this should be 1 again. Right, cosine of three pi over two is zero. One minus zero is one. So this means I have one comma three pi over two. So that puts me down here. Good. So e even like not knowing what like if I what kind of lemison I have, I just know this is a lemison. Um, if I see these four points, I know it has to be a cardioid, okay? Because I know that only cardioids and inner loops touch the pole. Dimples and convex lemisons do not touch the pole at all. And I knew that if I had an inner loop, I would get an intersection point where the inner loop was going to like do its loop thing, right? Because I don't have that, that means I must have something that does this. So I'm going to get uh, a cardioid. This was not symmetric. A really bad looking cardioid. Let's make this look a little better. Here we go. So looks like I have three intersections, right? One, two, and then one at the pole. Um, I don't know, right? I, I like, we haven't talked about um, how to figure out exactly like where this point is on the Lemison. So maybe I drew it too large. Maybe it actually does something like this. But regardless, we need to have an intersection there, right? It, it has to cross over this circle somehow to get up to, to that higher point. So I'm going to see and get uh, two intersections, OK? So now I'm going to go about actually finding them. Uh, so the first thing we do is we say, do we have an intersection r equals 0? Yes, we do, right? They intersect at the pole. And then we can set them equal, right? So I'm going to set cosine of theta equal to 1 minus cosine of theta. Again, if you want to go through and do the plus 2 pi n, um, you're welcome to. It's the same exact identity as last time, and it just turns into cosine of theta. Um, and so then I'm going to add this to both sides. I'm going to get 2 cosine of theta is equal to 1. So cosine of theta is equal to 1 half. And now we're in the same spot we were before, where theta is going to be equal to pi over 3 and 5 pi over 3, right, if we go through and solve this, because um, it's the same equation we had on the previous page. Um, and once we have this, um, now we say, OK, well, I'm going to plug it back in over here, right? So you just take these points, plug it into either of these equations. You can check that uh, no matter which one you plug it into, you're going to get the same thing, which is going to be a half for both of them. Um, so then my full solution set is going to be uh, 0, 0, 
um, 1 half pi over 3 and 1 half 5 pi over 3. All right. So, yeah, uh, another note, too, is, like, we write this intersection of the pole as 0, 0. You don't have to, right? I could write this as 0 pi or 0, 7 pi over 16 or anything I want, right? It doesn't actually matter. It's just kind of convention to do 0, 0. Um, but anything with an R value of 0 will be a point at the pole, okay? Good. Let's go on to number 3. So here we have 2 cosine of theta, and we have 1 plus cosine of theta. So this one is similar to the last one, right? We have a limason and we have a circle, uh, but it might look a little bit different this time. So I'm going to graph these. And again, just make a table, right? Do theta and r, theta and r, to figure out your points if you don't remember kind of where stuff should be. Um, so I do 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, same thing over here, 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2. And I plug them in. The cosine of 0 is 1, so this gives me 2, and then 0, and then negative 2, and 0. And over here, I'm going to get 1 plus 1 is 2, 1, and then 0, and 1. Okay, And now I can plot this. And we'll do our circle first. So uh, 2, 0, let's put that here. 0 pi over 2 will be here. Uh, negative 2 pi, right? We're going 2 to the left, and then we're rotating by pi. So that just overlaps with this point again. And the last point is just the pole again. So that means we're going to get a circle. Oh, this circle is so close. So close to being circular. Really, really didn't. The bottom didn't go so well. There we go. All right, it's, it's a circle. Uh, and then over here, we're going to go 2, 0. We have this. 1 comma pi over 2 is going to put me up here. 0 pi puts me at the pole. And then 1, 3 pi over 2 puts me down here. So this is going to be another um, cardioid, right? So I'm going to have something that goes up like this to here. And this is where, like, if you are really comfortable with cardioids and you kind of know that, okay, once they intersect this point, like they keep going up before coming back down a little bit. Um, that's helpful because then you know that like we, we're gonna shoot overshoot the circle and we're gonna come down and then we're gonna touch it here. And the same thing like this way. And I know these are terrible drawings, ter absolutely terrible drawings. But um, the idea, I'm gonna redo that side, right, is we know they share this point we know they share this point. Then the main question is, does the cardioid go up here? Um, or does it make a smaller thing and does it do something like that? Where then we'd have um, two more intersections. Uh, and you know, if you'll get enough cardioids, it's, it's gonna overshoot it, but you can always check. You could always set these equal, go ahead and actually solve it out. And you would find that the only intersections are gonna be these two, right? Um, and we can check this, I will check this, right? So it, it looks like my solution set should be equal to zero, zero, and 2, 0. But we can check. We can do 2 cosine theta equals 1 plus cosine theta. And then we get cosine of theta is equal to 1. Um, and then this tells me that uh, this is true for theta is equal to 0, right? Uh, and this gives me, if I plug this back in, I get r equals 2. So this gives me the point 2, 0. So that gives me the intersection that I want. And that's it. Um, you could go into 3 and see if you're missing, but, you know, you're not. You're not. The Lima sign is going uh, over it. Um, yeah, so as an exercise to the viewer, if you want to go and check it with uh, the third check for intersections, you're welcome to do that. All right, so that was the third one. Now let's get to some roses. So sine of 3 theta and uh, R2 is going to be equal to cosine of 3 theta. So roses for graphing them, right? If you know kind of the rules and you're familiar with roses, you can graph these no problem. If you're not, you can figure it out, right? So many of these things you can just figure out by playing with it. So make a table, right? So set up theta r and then uh, theta. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Don't make a table. <laughs> sorry. So you can make a table. That's fine. It will actually help you to draw a better picture, right? Um, but roses 
can be something like this, right? Where you get, oh my gosh, my that's a, quite the deformed rose. I wouldn't want to receive a rose like that. Um, so you can get something like this, right? Which doesn't actually have any intersections. Um, and so you can try a table. And if you uh, have intersections, then you have an easy time because you know that the petals must be evenly distributed across the plane. And so if you know, for example, there's an intersection here, right? Then you can say, oh, I'll just add however much to get over here and get to the next petal. Um, but one way you can kind of figure that out without making the table and then saying, oh, I didn't get any intersections. I guess I have to do this anyways, is by noticing that for roses, um, you are essentially looking for the angle where the rose petal's length uh, is maximized. And both these rose petals are going to have lengths of one um, away from the pole at their longest point. So what I can do is say, well, let me just solve this and set sine of three theta equal to one. And if I do this and solve for theta, um, that's gonna tell me what angle one of my rose petals is located at. Same thing over here, I can set cosine of three theta equal to one. I can solve this and this will give me the first angle uh, where my rose petal is equal to one. Um, and then from there I can just get locations of the other petals um, because I know they're evenly distributed. So for sine of three theta here, what I can do is say uh, that I'm gonna have um, three theta is gonna be equal to the arc sine of one and three theta is equal to the arc cos of one. Right. And then three theta, you say, okay, where is sine one? That's gonna be at pi over two. Uh, and then we're gonna have theta is equal to pi over six. So that's gonna be the location of one petal uh, for sine. For cosine, um, three theta is equal to zero. And that's where cosine is one. So then theta equals zero. So then using this, right, I can say, I also know that because they're evenly distributed, um, they must all, pe all each petal for each of the functions has to be separated by two pi divided by the number of petals. Because it's odd, you're gonna have three petals. So they're all gonna be separated by two pi over three. So we can then sketch this at long last. And say, all right, we'll do sine first. So pi over six, um, that's gonna put me, I don't know, here-ish. And then we say, okay, and then I wanna add two pi over three to that, right? So you can even get it an exact thing. You can say, okay, pi over six plus uh, four pi over six equal, I'm um, sorry, we get five pi, five pi over six, whoops. So that's gonna be over here. And then the last one we add, um, we do, we can again go plus four pi over six, right? It's gonna give us nine pi over six, which is three pi over two. So that's gonna give us something down here. And now we have, and I will do my best to make this look kind of like a rose. All these petals in theory are the same length uh, and the same width, but that's gonna be our, our sine, sine of three theta. And cosine, is we have zero, right? So we'll go over here. Uh, so this should probably be about right here. And then we add two pi over three to it, right? So that's gonna be um, probably around here. And the last one, we add two pi over three again, we're gonna end up like here. And so then we can sketch this. I encourage you to go uh, over to Desmos and uh, get a better look at this uh, because I am not a very good sketcher of things. So you can see though, the idea is we're gonna have three intersections, right? And we also have an intersection of the pole. So we should expect to see three, okay? That's kinda gonna be what we, we look to see as we do this. So we're gonna set them equal, right? So we're gonna have sine of three theta equals cosine of three theta. And once we're here, some people just get stumped and they're like, I don't know what to do. Do we expand it? Do we use trig identities? Can we do like a linear combination of sine and cosine? You could do a linear combination of sine and cosine actually. It's just gonna be like a lot of extra work, not for, for, for much reason. It's a much easier way to do it. Um, always look for like just what trig stuff can you do, right? We're working with trig functions. So like try to think about 
um, what would simplify this the quickest and the easiest? Um, and that would be dividing both sides by cosine of 3 theta, right? Because then I get tan 3 theta is equal to 1. Um, and then this is really easy to solve, right? You then say 3 theta is equal to arctan of 1. So you have 3 theta is pi over 4 plus pi n. And we divide both sides by 3. So theta equals pi over 12. Um, and this is where, so this is where I say, okay, pi over 12, um, there's going to be, I can add stuff to this, right? And I won't actually get outside of the range that um, I'm kind of putting myself in of 0 to 2 pi. So I actually am going to have a bunch of values. So we're going to say, um, we'll make a little table of theta and r. So I have pi over 12, right? And I could write this as pi over 12 plus 4 pi over 12 n. Um, and what other values do I get? So I can add 4. So I get 5 pi over 12. I can get 9 pi over 12. I can get 13 pi over 12, 17 pi over 12, and 21 pi over 12. And if I continue, right, the next thing I get is 25 pi over 12, which is just the same as pi over 12, so I, I stop there. And I want to figure out what our values these correspond to. And already, some, this is kind of interesting because we only expected to get three intersections, right? But right now I have six different angles. So that's kind of interesting. Um, so if we plug pi over 12 back in, we get root 2 over 2. This gives us negative root 2 over 2. This gives us root 2 over 2, negative root 2 over 2, root 2 over 2, and negative root 2 over 2. And then I can look at each of these and think about these points. The point pi over tw uh, root 2 over 2 comma pi over 12. OK, that's going to be in quadrant 1. You know, And I can go around. Once I get here, though, this point, negative root 2 over 2, 13 pi over 12, that's doing the following. If I kind of sketch this go here. Let's go to the first one, right? So root 2 over 2, pi over 12, right here. Or I'll, I'll exaggerate this, right? Let's say this angle is pi over 12. If I do negative root 2 over 2, so I'm over here, and then I rotate by 13 pi over 12, that's the same as rotating by pi, and then an extra pi over 12, which means this just takes me to the same exact spot as my first point did. And so these are actually the same point. Same thing happens with these two. These two points are the same. And these two points are the same. So we're actually getting some redundant solutions here. Okay, um, and because these are the same, we don't need to worry about these ones, right? We can just say our solution set is gonna be equal to zero, zero, and then the three other um, points that, that are the ones we want. So uh, root two over two comma pi over 12, negative root 2 over 2, comma 5 pi over 12. You could put, make this into a positive r if you wanted to, but it's not a, not a big deal. Root 2 over 2, 9 pi over 12. All right, and then that is our solution. Okay, So um, you can get redundant solutions. It happens, right? This is one of the things, like, the uniqueness of polar points doesn't only make it so that sometimes you miss intersections. Sometimes it means that you're going to get the same intersection over and over again. Um, so just something to something to watch out for. Okay, so now we're on to the final one, and this one, this one is going to be more involved. So I have these two limissons, right? We're doing two limissons here. I'm going to make a table for each of these. So we're going to do theta and r. Theta and r. So here, zero pi over two, pi, three pi over two. Cosine of zero is one, right? So we're gonna get four, uh, and then we get zero, so this is two, and then zero, and then two. Over here, uh, zero, we plug in zero, we get one. Pi over two, we get four. Three pi over two, we get negative two, and oh, I like missed pi. Whoops. The very root of me just skipping over arguably the best angle. Um, so sine of pi is zero, so this gives us one. And then three pi over two. I'm gonna give us negative one, so negative two. Okay, so now we can try to plot this. And we'll do the left one first. So four, zero, that's gonna be out here. 
2 pi over 2. It's going to be like half the, maybe around here. 0 pi puts us here. And 2, 3 pi over 2 puts us down here. So we have a cardioid, right? This is going to be something like this. And then this one, we have 1 comma 0, so that's going to be like here. 4 pi over 2, that's going to put us up here. Maybe make it a little lower. I want it to be twice the distance, so I guess here. My, my scales are not quite perfect. Okay. And then 1 comma pi, right? So we already did that, so 1 pi will put us on the other side over here. And then negative 2, 3 pi over 2, puts us right back to this point. So this tells me, right, I have this point, this point, this point, and this point. This tells me I have an inner loop. It's telling me that um, what I'm missing is I also have an intersection with the pole. And because I have two points like this on the same side, this must do something like this, where I go, um, I have some kind of inner loop. So looking at this, there are two obvious intersections, right? One, two, and, and the pole. And then things get a little iffy because this inner loop, depending on how wide or skinny it is, certainly looks like it crosses here and probably something's going on here. It's a little hard to see that one, but I, it, it kind of feels that way. Um, so regardless, even if we're not sure, we know we should get these two intersections, right? So we're going to go through, we're going to say, okay, our first thing, r equals zero. Um, yes, it does. Both of them intersect the pole, so we have an intersection there. Then we're going to say, okay, let's go ahead and solve this and um, see what we get, see what intersections we get. So we're going to set these equal. So we're going to have um, 2 plus 2 cosine theta is equal to 1 plus 3 sine theta. And we will rearrange this a bit. So we'll get 2 cosine of theta minus 3 sine of theta equals negative 1. And this is another point where depending on how long it's been since you've done trig, you might be kind of stuck here. Um, but this is where we have to use the linear combination of sine and cosine with equal arguments. So the brief refresher, remember, is you're doing this. A cosine theta plus B sine theta. And you should be able to write this um, as a single trig function of the form c cosine theta minus d. Right. So um, I do have a video on that. So if you haven't seen that before, go and check out linear combination of sine and cosine with equal arguments. Um, but I'm going to assume you've seen this as we continue. So to get our coefficient, our c value, the amplitude, we do the square root of 4 plus 9. Right? Uh, 2 squared, negative 3 squared. So this is going to give us root 13. And to get the d value, we can do pretty much whatever. So I'll say, um, I don't know, we'll do inverse cosine. So I'll say cosine of theta has to be equal to um, 2 over root 13. Remember, when you do this part, you can use whatever ratio you want. You can say cosine is that. You could say sine of theta equals um, negative 3 over root 13. You could say tan of theta equals uh, negative 3 over 2. All of these things are going to give you a reference angle, OK? After you get that reference angle, you have to think about what quadrant you actually want to be in. I look back here. This coefficient of cosine is positive. Coefficient of sine is negative. So we think about, OK, ASTC, what quadrant is cosine positive and sine negative? That's quadrant 4. So whatever reference angle I get, I want to make sure that if it's not in quadrant 4, I move it into the quadrant I want by you know adding pi or subtracting, or doing whatever. right? So if I do inverse cosine, I get theta is equal to negative 56.3 degrees. This is already in quadrant 4, so we're good. Um, so then I can rewrite this function uh, down here as root 13 cosine of x, uh, sorry, theta, be consistent, uh, plus 56.3 degrees. Remember, this turns into a plus because the standard form has um, theta minus the angle. So because we have a negative, minus a negative is a positive. So we have this equal to negative 1. Okay? And then we want to solve this for theta. So here you're just solving a trigonometric equation. So this tells me cosine of theta plus 
56.3 degrees is equal to negative 1 over root 13. So then theta um, is going to be equal to negative 56.3 degrees. Uh, and I'm going to do plus, so I'm taking the inverse cosine. So inverse cosine or arc cos of negative 1 over root 13. Skipping steps a little bit here, sorry. So we're taking the inverse cosine of both sides, right? So that gives us theta plus 56.3 equals negative 1 over root 13, um, the inverse cosine of that. And so then I, I uh, subtract 56.3 from both sides after I've taken the inverse cosine. Then once we're here, right, we all get uh, theta equals negative 56.3 degrees. Um, and then the inverse cosine of negative 1 over root 13 is going to be 106.1. So remember, this means we have plus or minus 106.1 degrees plus 360 degrees n. And also remember that plus or minus is not something you just automatically do whenever you do an inverse trig function, right? It is unique to cosine. Um, and that is because if I have an angle here that works, well, cosine is also positive in quadrant 4. So negative of that angle also works. Same thing over here, right? If I have a negative value for cosine, I can just flip it, right? Flip the angle and I end up down here, and that also works. Um, you can also think of it because cosine is an even function, right? So for sine, you have to be more careful because if I am here, I want an angle that's here. So I'd have to do like pi minus this one uh, or 180 minus that one to get the other angle. And tangent, right, is, is like this. So you just take your first angle and then just add pi n, add pi, add pi, add pi. So you can just add pi n to it and you're good. Okay. Um, so yeah, that, sh that should all be old hat. You should all be able to do that. So then um, from here, I can split this into two equations, right? Uh, or I can just say, well, yeah, this is um, theta gonna, is going to be equal to, if I pick n is equal to 0, right, then I'm going to get 270 and 337.4. Or sorry, no, I'm not. I looked at the wrong thing. <laughs> I'm going to get 49, spoilers, I'm going to get 49.8 degrees, and I'm going to get 197.6 degrees. The 197.6 is because if I do negative 56, minus 106, right? I get a really big negative angle, and I turn that positive by doing 360 minus whatever the angle that was, and I get 197.6. So these are my two angles, and if I plug them back in, I can get the R values associated with them, which are 3.29 and 0 0.09. So let's look back and see what intersections did we just find. Uh, so we have one at 197.6, so 197.6 is down here. So we found this intersection. Um, and that, that makes sense as a really small r value, 0.09, because it should be pretty close to the uh, pole. The other one we found was 49 degrees. So that is the one up here, right? 3.29. So we found these two intersections. This is a problem because we weren't even sure this, this we kind of thought existed, but we weren't sure. But I know there's an intersection here, right? This is a point that is on both of these graphs. I need to find this one. I am missing it. So this is where we need to go on and do part three of this problem, where now we have to use our third definition, right, where we say, okay, clearly what's going on here is there is a point on one of these graphs, which is R something, and on the other graph, it actually has a negative R value. And so it, it, it's going to not quite match up when we do this first method, because the two points are not actually equal to each other for the same value of theta. So we need to go on and say, all right, this means we're going to take 2 plus 2 cosine of theta plus 2n plus 1 pi, and we're going to set it equal to negative 1 minus 3 sine theta, right? So we replaced um, theta in one of the functions with theta plus 2n plus 1 times pi, and the other function we just made negative, right? The r value has become negative for this function. And now we're going to solve for this value of theta. So again, we can use a trig identity here. We can say 2 plus 2 um, times, and this is going to be cosine theta, cosine uh, 2n plus 1 pi, and then minus sine theta, sine of 2n plus 1 pi. And this is equal to negative 1 minus 3 sine theta. Then we can simplify this, right? I can say, okay, well, sine of, if I pick like n equals 0 to make it easy to think about, um, or 2n plus 1 is just odd values of pi, right? So sine of 1 pi or 3 pi or 5 pi, always 0. So this thing, again, goes away. And over here, cosine of odd values of pi gives me negative 1. So this turns into 
2 minus 2 cosine of theta is equal to negative 1 minus 3 sine of theta. And then from here, I can rearrange this into 2 cosine of theta minus 3 sine of theta equals 3. So what you'll note is we have the exact same combination of sine and cosine that we did um, in the, oh no, I'm doing this on a different side, oops. We have the same combination of sine and cosine that we had um, over here, right? We have two cos minus three sine. The thing that's different is what it's equal to, is over here it's equal to negative one, and what we have instead is equal to three. So we're gonna go through and solve this, but the nice thing is we don't have to redo our work, right? We know this is still going to be equal to root 13 cosine uh, theta plus 56.3 degrees is equal to three. And we solve this the same way, right? You're gonna get theta is equal to negative 56.3 degrees plus or minus 33.7 degrees plus 360 degrees n and this gives you theta is equal to 270 degrees and 337.4 degrees. Okay, The corresponding R values, and this is where it gets really tricky. The corresponding R values, you cannot take these angles and plug it into either of the original functions. Okay, um, Because that is not what we are actually doing in this problem. Right? We are looking at the fact that because these uh, angles are not unique, uh, that one angle is going to have a negative R value and the other is going to have the, you know, just be shifted by, um, by pi. So what you need to do to get a, a, a point that works, for example, we want 270, right? If I take 270, uh, my original functions, right? I had R1, I had 2 plus 2 cosine theta and 1 plus 3 sine theta. If I plug it into R2, which is the thing we made negative, I get negative 2. If I plug it into R1, I get positive two. Positive two does not actually work, right? We had our, our intersection, we had something like this. Um, what was our other Lima sun? I don't remember. We had an intersection up here, right? So if we have an intersection at the top of the inner loop, then negative two, 270 works. Positive two, 270 takes me down here where there's nothing, okay? So what you need, you just need to be careful because this point, right, on this graph uh, is indeed negative 2, 270. On the other graph, the R coordinate, R coordinate associated with this point is not negative 2, right? Um, what you need to do, or sorry, the, the angle, well, both of those are true. The angle, 270 degrees, is only for R2. If you want the angle that works for the first one, if I want to plug something in here and figure out what point um, this matches up to on my first graph, then I don't plug in 270. I need to plug in uh, 270 degrees plus, and I switch from radians to degrees as well in this problem, oops, um, plus 180 degrees, right? So that's going to give me 450. 450 degrees is 90 degrees. And if I plug that in, then I say, okay, 90 degrees into the first one, cosine of 90 uh, is zero, and that gives me positive two. So this point, the point, um, the point 270 degrees, uh, or negative two, 270 degrees, this is the point on R2. Okay, the point on R1 is 2 comma 90 degrees. These are the same point, right? This is the whole point. Like they have an intersection um, at this point in space and there are two different ways of getting this point in space. But the, the reason you can't plug it into either one is because one of them literally just like it doesn't have a point for the input of 270 degrees. Um, or it doesn't have the, um, the, that's not the point that corresponds to the intersection. So just be careful. When you get here, plug it into uh, the thing that you made negative, and that should give you something that it actually works as a point. If you want to plug it into the one that you added 180 to, then when you plug in your angle, you need to add 180 to it because that is what you are actually finding. Okay, so now you did the same thing is is true for this one, right? If we plug it back into the original, we're going to get uh, negative 0 0.15, and now we have our full set of intersections. We have five intersections, just like we thought we should by looking at this. And so we can write down that our full solution set, right, is going to be 0, 0, um, 0 0.09, 197.6 degrees, negative 2, 270 degrees. Or you don't have to write this, right? You couldn't write 290 degrees. That's fine as well, right? 
either one of these is okay. You, you shouldn't write both. <laughs> Don't actually write what I'm writing here. I'm doing this to show you that you could do either one of these, okay? Um, and then negative 0 0.15, 337.4 degrees. Um, and again, this is going to have an or one where there's another value that works here that's going to be on the other graph um, and is at the same point in space. So you could find that if you wanted to use that point instead. And the last one is 3.29, 49.8 degrees. And that's your full solution set, right? And that gives us all five of our intersections. Okay. So uh, a little bit tricky, right? The ones that are tricky are the last bit here. Um, is this this one where you're looking for the missing intersections. If you want to think about this more deeply and try to understand uh, further why it works, right, it, it really boils down to the non-uniqueness of polar points. Um, just think about the points and how they're represented on the two graphs. Um, and, and, and if you think about that, that's really why uh, you're, you're getting these kind of missing intersections here um, because it's a separate kind of class of intersections in the first one. Um, it's a set of points where the points themselves, right, do not have the same numerical value. They are not, like, R1 does not equal R2. Theta1 does not equal Theta2, right? But they represent the point, same point in space uh, because of this argument we made back in the first page where, well, R1 is equal to negative R2 where Theta is equal to Theta plus Pi, so that's, uh, that's why you get that with intersections of polar, and you don't get it in Cartesian. Thanks for watching.